see my screen there? I should say objectives. Yep. Sure do. It's big screen this time too. Yeah, I'm getting better at this as we go along. <laughs> All right, this one's not very big um, and probably a little bit more understandable. It's more real life, uh, talking about some tangible items here. So objectives for this ILM here, describe the components of signal transmission systems. We are gonna look at how the signal gets from A to B, whether it's wired or wireless. So we'll talk about wire technology and wireless technology. Uh, we'll look at the different transmission mediums, so wire, uh, fiber optics, radio waves, those types of things. First off, system component. Transmission media is either guided, meaning that we're using some type of a cable, or unguided, which means wireless for our purposes here. The choice of medium will often dictate the distances and speeds that data is transmitted. So proper cable selection is critical in instrumentation systems. The signal that is sent must arrive as a readable value at the receiver. And this ties directly to that signal loss that is inherent to most uh, signaling systems. So that signal should look the same when it is received as it did when it was sent. Properties uh, of wire that affect the transmission are resistance, capacitance, and inductance and those of you that are electricians probably remember this from electrical school and we talked about the what do we call that rlc or something back in the day there when we did electrical stuff so we're going to spend a couple of minutes here looking at the properties of cabled systems and what we have to be aware of in terms of the signal getting from a to b so metallic cables is where we're going to start. Some common terms uh, related to metallic cabling and data transmission. The first is propagation, and that means how something travels. The second term is called attenuation, which is the term that defines the reduction in amplitude or strength of the signal. So, for example, if I send out a 5-volt signal from my transmitter, and by the time it gets to my receiver, it's three volts, we could say that I had attenuated two volts of my signal. So it's basically a, a measure of the loss of signal. Then we talk about LRC, which is the inductance, resistance, and capacitance qualities of a cable or wire. Got some good spelling mistakes here. Uh, these properties of the wire are what lead to the signal degradation and what limit us in the distance that we can send a signal over a wire type transmission medium. Okay, attenuation. The transmission strength or the voltage amplitude is reduced due to resistance in the transmission medium or the wire. And this graphic represents the resistance of our cabling down here, the signal that we send, and excuse me, the signal that is received on the other end. And this greater amplitude signal has been attenuated and results in a smaller amplitude signal at the receiver. How do I get rid of that thing? So this is why we have that range or that transition area that allows us to accept a smaller value on the receiving end than was sent and that's to compensate for this attenuation that typically happens in any type of cabling system yes michael i think i lost a connection i did not catch which powerpoint is this one which what powerpoint this is the second ILM for signal transmission systems. Can everybody else see it? Yeah, I can see it fine. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Just you, Michael. Okay. 
Can yeah, I'm out? okay, but I don't know what's the file name in the PowerPoint section uh, from the website. Uh, it should be signal transmissions part B or the ILM number uh, AB. Why do you need that? I just Are want to locate it? your PowerPoint. In the course material? Yeah, on your website, you uploaded those PowerPoint. I, I hope so. Hang on, let's look. Signal transmission, small a, big B. It's there, I just saw it. In the communication folder. Okay, so this is attenuation. The LRC line model here, inductive resistance capacitance, every conductor has a certain value for LRC per unit length. This itself causes the degradation of the signal. In essence, in essence, it makes itself a low pass filter. That means that it cuts out some of the higher frequencies, but the lower ones are unaffected. What happens with this effect is that it can change a square wave shape, which is representative of a digital signal, which is what we're mostly dealing with, into a hump shaped signal which we don't want. And the reason that this is a problem for us is, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the different protocols that we'll talk about will use the transition from, uh, from this voltage level to this voltage level as an indicator of a change of state. So if this is not steep enough, it may not get recognized as a transition. And as a result, you'll have corrupt data. So the LRC component of the cabling is important because we want to make sure that we have as sharp of a corner as we can so that we get a clear and definitive transition between our ones and our zeros. So this is what the LRC component looks like in a, in a series loop. If we were looking at it, the resistive component, the inductive component, and the capacitive component. We don't get it in, don't get into it too deeply, but essentially what it makes is a, a low pass filter, which has a tendency to knock off the higher, the higher end of uh, the signal, and that can be problematic. So we have to be aware of it. If you find that your signals aren't strong enough, it's usually because the cable length is too long and the contribution of the LRC component is too much, and that's why we can't transmit that data. Okay, electromagnetic interference, of course, uh, exists. We did labs in third year that showed uh, the effects of EMF on a signal. Cables are subject to uh, these interferences that will affect the signal. They include electromagnetic noise, uh, something called crosstalk, which is what happens when we put too many cables uh, of different types in a tray, and signal reflection, which is when the signal gets the end of the hits the end of the bus and then starts bouncing back and collides with another signal. Uh, this is the main reason that we use those um, termination resistors, and we'll address that in the next couple of slides here. Okay, signal reflection, and this relates to these termination resistors. So the rising and falling edges of a digital signal are in the frequency range of a 100,000 kilohertz. Um, this is important because to maintain the value, we have to have consistent impedance in our cable. If it's not there, we end up with signals bouncing back and distorting the intended signal. To eliminate this, we use the end of line or termination resistors at the end of every signal. So here's what happens. We send a nice clean signal. It goes all the way to the end. It bounces back off the end of the wiring run and then it collides with the next signal that's coming this way and it creates a dirty combination signal. What can happen in the system here is when it goes up and then it comes back down again, this can be counted as a transition the same way that this 
can be counted as a transition. So that introduces errors, and of course, we don't want that. Metallic cable types. So we're going to look at the different types of cable. Uh, may or may not be important to us. Uh, as a general rule, we deal almost exclusively with shielded twisted pair or STP cable. Um, and that's pretty much the industry standard, but there are situations where unshielded twisted pair multi-conductor cables and or coaxial cables will be used in an industrial network. So we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about each of these um, metallic cable types. Okay, first off, shielded twisted pair. Uh, of course, mo most widely used, the wires are twisted to ensure that they are equally exposed to any induced noise. So it's not by accident that the wires are twisted. Uh, these are suited to noisy industrial environments. That's because they have the shielding and they have the twisting that helps eliminate uh, external interference. The shield is a metal foil or sometimes a braided conductor, which must be terminated properly. And uh, you may uh, have different practices for doing this in the field. Uh, lots of times you'll, you'll take the braid and you will strip it and you'll wind it back around the cable and then you'll tape it up in the field. Remember, no shield in the field. Uh, and the purpose for that is, of course, to maintain a uh, single point ground in our cabinet. Um, when we have distortion in cabling, of course, it's going to limit our bandwidth. And that basically means that it limits the amount of data that we can successfully transmit. The impedance value for shielded twisted care, uh, pair cable is about 100 ohms. As we go through these different cables, you'll see that the impedance values will change. Uh, you can find the impedance value for a particular type of cable on the data sheet for that type of cable. Uh, I believe there are examples in the IM, ILM that, that will tell you the impedance value for a cable. Uh, the reason this is important is because the termination resistor value matches the impedance value of the cable. So if I had a termination resistor for uh, a bus that I was using shielded twisted pair on, I would have a 100 ohm resistor as my termination resistor. Second type of cabling here is unshielded twisted pair or UTP. Uh, it's the least expensive and most widely used inside of buildings. Uh, wires are twisted just like shielded twisted pair, but we do not have the shield. These are suitable for office environments where the noise is less of an issue. Uh, and the noise that we're talking about in an, in an industrial application is usually the noise that's introduced through high voltage switching, whether it's motors or lighting circuits and things like that. A uh, classic example of an unshielded twisted pair is Cat5. Uh, so you can associate that with lots of office wiring uh, unshielded twisted pair. Okay, unshielded twisted pairs capable of very high speeds. Uh, and you can relate that to Cat5 and Ether, which is gigabyte speed communication. The last cable that we look at, oh, sorry, we'll do that in a second. Comparing shielded versus unshielding, uh, unshielded side to side. Shielded better for noise, unshielded not good for noisy environments. Shielded has a drain wire or some type of a, a braided shield. Unshielded, of course, does not. Impedance, about the same. Shield is the most common wiring used out there in most plants nowadays that aren't on some type of a field bus network. More and more facilities are switching to field bus networks, but just about any pre-existing facility is gonna use point-to-point -point device wiring with shielded twisted pairs. Uh, shielded, of course, has the foil or braided shield, and speed will be the same. So, typically, as instrument people, we're not going to be dealing with unshielded wiring, uh, and most facilities won't even have unshielded wiring on site because some electrician is likely to grab it and use it out in the field, and, and you'll end up with all kinds of problems. Next slide. Coaxial cable. So coaxial cable, not 
super common uh, in field wiring, but quite common when you're talking about wiring between cabinets and home run wires from field cabinets to uh, the DCS or PLC marshalling areas. So coaxial, also shielded from noise, as you can see by the foil wire in the diagram, or the foil wrap in the diagram and the uh, braided copper wire on the outside. Uh, coaxial cable has a larger bandwidth and higher data carrying capabilities than twisted cables. Reduces distortion by increasing uh, the distance and dielectric between the shield and inner conductor. So making bigger coaxial cables separates this wire from other wires, uh, allowing us to get better isolation. Uh, by reducing or by increasing the isolation, isolation and reducing the distortion, we as a result can increase our bandwidth or the amount of data that we can transmit. Coaxial cable, typical impedance of 75 ohms. So we'd use a 75 ohm termination resistor. And one of the more common applications that you will find coaxial cable uh, is control net. Some of you may have used control net. Some of you may have not used control net. Fiber optic. So switching from metallic cable to fiber optic cable or glass cable. Fiber optics, of course, use an optically conductive core and a less dense cladding. Cladding, here we go, to transmit light by refraction. So benefit, of course, for fiber optics and the reason that we're switching to them, uh, technologically increasing as we step through these different types of mediums. Fiber optic is our current uh, state of the art. It's immune to all electrical noise and it's intrinsically safe. And that alone is a pretty good, pretty huge benefit for industrial cabling. Uh, the downside, of course, is it's a lot more difficult to deal with. Fiber optics produce the highest bandwidth available, and most of our home internet service providers have fiber optic uh, trunk wiring. So going between the boxes in your back alleys will be fiber optic, and then you'll have uh, coaxial cable coming from the alley to your house. So don't let the advertisers fool you when they say, oh, we got fiber optic internet. Well, you do, but it's only to the back alley and it's still limited by the cable spec that's coming from that box in the alley up to your house. Okay, operation of fiber optic cabling here. Uh, a light source, usually infrared, is used to send pulses through circuitry that detects it on the receiving end and decodes it as digital information. So we have a light flashing off and on, sending our ones and zeros through the fiber optic cable. And if you were staring at the end of this cable over here, you would see the light coming off and on. And if you had a, an optical detector here, it would count the same pulses that were sent, convert them into electronic signals so that your computer could use it or your PLC system could use it and we get uh, some configuration of voltage here. If it's RS-232, it's between 5 and 15. If it's 485, it's between 2 and 6, et cetera, et cetera. How the light travels through the cable uh, is a characteristic of the cable construction, which is probably more information that you, than you need, because in my brain and your brain, probably you shine a light in here and the light comes out the other end. And we can see that quite clearly if we look at a fiber optic cable. Um, but what's going on inside that cable is a little bit more complicated. And we'll talk about the characteristics of how that light carries itself down the cable in the next few slides. Because although fiber optic cabling is the current state of the art, it does have uh, some issues and, and concerns that we have to be familiar with. Okay, so different types of fiber construction and characteristics and the resulting signals that you will see at the other end. And it all really has to do with how straight of a line does that light signal make as it travels through that cable. The straighter the signal is, 
the better quality of a signal that we're going to get, the more uh, convoluted its travel path is, the weaker signal that we're going to get on the end. The transition between uh, the, the signal quality from the beginning to the end or the uh, loss of signal is called modal dispersion. And you can drop that one at the supper table tonight if you want. So looking at different types of fiber here, large core fiber, lots of room for the signal to bounce around in there. So we send an input pulse, common input pulse down all of these different types of cables. What happens as it goes down there? So some of the signal will go straight through, some of it will bounce once or twice, some of it will bounce all over the place, and the resultant pulse we see at the end is kind of a mix of all those different light signals that have been received. We reduce that core size a little bit, of course, reducing, reducing the amount of area that the signal can bounce in. We get a somewhat better representation of the signal on the receiving end. And then by reducing this here to down to a single mode fiber is what we call this. We get a nice straight shot line signal on the receiving end. It's just about the same signal that we get when we send it. So when we lose signal or optical signal, we call that modal dispersion. Okay, signal losses or modal dispersions can be caused by a number of different things. Uh, first off is absorption of where the photons are absorbed by impurities in the core glass wire. <coughs> Using proper frequencies of light transmission can help to reduce this. The second issue is called scattering, where light reflects off impurities in the core. Modal dispersion, of course, when light takes different paths down the core. Bends. And this is uh, related to installation specifically. Uh, micro bends from manufacturing defects, so very small bends, and macro bends, which are caused during installation. So a couple of things related to bending. And I'm not sure why these are red, aside from red is important. Last but not least, a uh, contributor to uh, signal loss here is coupling, which is uh, signal loss resulting from misaligned splices. And I know back in the day, 10, 20 years ago, when fiber optics first started coming out, it was a big deal to be a fiber optic splicing guy. Uh, now I'm pretty sure they got it down to a little kit that just about anybody can do. So all of these are potential uh, issues in terms of signal loss with fiber optic cabling. So not impervious to signal issues, but certainly much better than uh, metallic cabling overall. Okay, advantages and disadvantages. These are widely used to their long distance and high data rate ability, as well as their low EMF effect. And that is why we are using fiber optics now, uh, or most in uh, internet service providers are using fiber optics as their uh, main distribution trunk wiring method and then we get our little coaxial drops coming to our house because they can go long, 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 long distances, great big long distances. So advantages, non-conductive, impervious to electromagnetic interference, they're intrinsically safe, they're immune to crosstalk, they have great high bandwidths. And by high bandwidths, we're talking gigabytes to terabytes. So we've come a long way from RS-232 at 1200 bits to uh, terabytes, which is billions of bits per second. So huge differences in technology. Uh, longer distances available, lower power needs, uh, and more secure, which is a big benefit when we talk about security in, inter in industrial networks later. We have a section where we talk about security. Uh, very hard to tap into a fiber optic cable without breaking it first. Whereas on a uh, a wired system, a shielded twisted pair system, for example, you can just clip onto the wires without breaking the wires and nobody would be the wiser. Disadvantages of fiber optics, um, no power providing capability. So you can't power a transmitter with fiber optics like we can with shielded twisted pair. Uh, fussy installation, so specifically uh, making sure that your, your couplings 
uh, are connected properly so you don't get any distortion in your signals. Uh, you don't bend them, you don't kink them, you don't break the glass fibers. Uh, in order to do these, you're going to need special tools and test equipment, and you'll probably require special training. So although they're, they're good, it does take some extra skill to implement. Okay, different types and connectors of fiber optics here. So cable type is specified by bandwidth, construction, fiber count, core material, and sheath material. And you're going to learn a lot more about fiber optic cables than you probably ever wanted to. Here we have a graphic uh, showing two different uh, types of fiber optic cable. The first one is called a multi-mode cable, which has a very large core. And again, with the large core, you get a lot of these uh, reflections coming down the line. And we have single mode cable over here, which has a smaller core and allows for uh, a more representative signal from end to end. For two-way communication, we need two cables, one for transmitting and one for receiving, of course. Otherwise, we'd have light pulses flashing back and forth to each other, and that just would not work. Connectors, uh, not going to be a big thing for you uh, test-wise, um, but good for you to know as a technician uh, what, what type of connectors that you're dealing with out there. You've probably dealt with the first type. Uh, they're quite common, called an ST connector or a bayonet connector. Second type is called an FC connector, uh, very similar to a bayonet, except that the bayonet kind of has the pins and the half turn sort of method. Uh, the FC connector threads on, so it's a little bit more secure in terms of its mounting. Uh, you'll see, you'll probably see mostly these in industry. Uh, Bentley Nevada, vibration probes, things like that, will usually use this type of a connector. Maybe this type of a connector. I haven't seen these myself in the field. Uh, finally, this last little dirty one at the bottom here called an FDDI connector. These are typically uh, office type, laboratory type connectors. Um, again, not going to drill you very hard on these. Uh, this is more for personal enrichment. All right, so that takes care of the physical, quote unquote, hardwired uh, methods. So a shielded twisted pair, unshielded twisted pair, coaxial and fiber optic, we call a hardwired or guided type transmission. The next section here deals with unguided transmission or radio communication, or you can call it Wi-Fi if you want to call it that. Wi-Fi definitely falls into this category. Um, so radio communication, those of you who are SCADA gurus out there will have a lot more experience in this section than I will. Okay, so some applications, of course, make it impossible or unfeasible to run wire. And this is common in Alberta with our remote well sites that are often in places where there is no infrastructure available to hook up to, say, a TELUS network or a Shaw network or a telephone line or something like that. So common example, SCADA systems, uh, pipelines, tank farms, uh, in the electrical industry, you know, transformer stations and, and things of that nature. So these situations will require the use of radio communication. <clears throat> so industrial radio systems are what we use to get this job done. And these systems will typically have three parts. The first part is the radio set that is used to transmit and receive the signal. The modem, which of course modulates and demodulates the digital data that is sent from our terminal equipment, uh, which uses ones and zeros to the, uh, the communication equipment, which takes that one and zero and modulates it into a waveform that can be sent through the air and received on the other end. Sometimes the modem is built right in, sometimes it's separate. And then in order to send or receive, we need an antenna. And the antenna's job is to convert the electrical signals uh, into waves and vice versa. So it turns the digital signal into a wave so it can be sent and then 
that wave is captured by an antenna on the other end and the communication equipment then converts it back, <clears throat> excuse me, into a baseband signal. So in order to send uh, radio signals, they send a sine wave out there of different frequencies. These different frequencies are called frequency bands. These bands reside within a spectrum, which is a collection of a frequency range that is assigned for a particular type of application. Uh, you may have heard of uh, VHF or UHF. These are types of uh, bands or frequency bands that fit within a spectrum. And a spectrum contains all the different bands. Uh, these are governed internationally by the United Nations via, uh, via the International Telecommunications Union. And in Canada, they are governed by the Spectrum Management and Telecommunications Department of Industry Canada. In the States, and we're usually more familiar with these uh, organizations in the States, but that is the FCC. We consider the radio spectrum to be a natural resource, just like rivers and lakes. Um, it's out there, but it is a finite resource. There is only so much bandwidth that is available in every frequency band, so it is monitored and regulated so that it can be used by different organizations. So the regulations that are in place are there, and they also consider uh, the frequencies that we use bandwidth that we are going to use, the amount of power that is required, so how far you transmit is related to the amount of power that is available, and whether you're using it for data or communications use. So different applications for everything. So not only does our industrial network communication rely on this, but the same, uh, the same government agencies and the same legislations also covers the radio stations that you listen to, the internet service providers that bring the internet into our homes. So here's a look at the spectrum and how the spectrum kind of breaks out. You'll see there's many different categories out there uh, varying in terms of uh, their frequencies, so low frequencies, medium frequencies, high, very high, ultra high, super high, extremely high. And you can see here the frequency ranges associated with each of these categories. So 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz, 300 kilohertz to 3 mega, all of these different ranges. Um, I don't expect you to memorize all the different ranges uh, that we show here, but be aware of the ranges that are specific to us and our trade. So it says here, most industrial data uses frequency in the VHF to UHF and SHF bands. So VHF, UHS, SHF. So 30 megahertz to 30 gigahertz. So this takes us into some pretty high frequency transmissions. And if we took every one of these waves at 30 gigahertz, uh, 30 million cycles per second, that's a lot of ones and zeros. Okay, so uh, some examples of some uses of these ranges here, 3 to 30 here. So AM radio is in that range. And you can verify that if you have a, an old radio back in the day, you'd have the dial on your radio. And at the bottom of the dial, you're turning to 630 Chad. Well, 630 Chad is 630 somewhere on this scale here. Uh, three, 30 to 300, so FM radio, TV broadcasts are in that area here. Uh, 300 to 3000, TV signals are in there, satellite communications, mobile phones, GPS, wireless LANs. So we get into the stuff that's common today in the 300 plus megahertz. So that's why they're saying most of the stuff that we deal with is in this VHF, UHF, SHF, and higher uh, area of the spectrum. Frequency propagation. So propagation, how does it travel? As a radio signal travels, 
it hits things and it spreads out and is absorbed, becoming weaker or it becomes attenuated. We have to be aware of that when we have uh, systems that rely on unguided media. The way that a signal is degraded here, uh, this kind of is a flashback to third year when we talked about radiation, how radiation intensity decreases with the double or the square of the distance from the source. Uh, if you remember that from third year, this is the same kind of theory that applies to the way a signal is attenuated as it travels through air. Uh, after one distance, it loses half. After two distances, it's a quarter. After three distances, it's one ninth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is called radio frequency attenuation. And we call this Newton's inverse square law. And that's how, that's the relationship to this square of the source. Okay, absorption of radio signals rules through the air or structures, of course, reduces its effectiveness. When we speak of these signals flying through the air, one thing to think about is that low frequencies penetrate better than higher ones. I'll always stop at this point and say, imagine yourself sitting at the traffic light, minding your own business, and some 20-year-old in his Honda all souped up pulls up beside you, and all you can hear is the bass pounding, well, boom, boom, boom. You can't hear the, you know, the symbols going tick, 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 tick. And this relates to this statement here, low frequencies penetrate better than higher ones, bass being a low frequency, treble signals being a higher frequency. So file that away in the back of your head, low frequencies penetrate better than higher ones. Uh, you can relate that back to third year. Also, if you wanted to, when we talked about radar level transmitters, uh, we said that low frequency uh, radar transmitters were better for solids than high frequency ones or whatever it was back then. Optics also affect the signal path. So not just objects that it runs into, but the line of sight affects the signal that they travel. So refraction, reflection, diffraction, interference, all of these are components that will affect how a signal travels through the air. Refraction redirects the signal. Unless it hits at 90 degrees uh, or square on, it'll redirect the signal in a different direction. If it hits square on, it'll usually just come straight back. <clears throat> refraction can also be caused by density changes in the medium, and in the medium, in this case, it's the air, so clouds and things of that nature can cause an issue for radio waves. Reflection, smooth surfaces reflect well. So irregular surfaces don't reflect well. So as the signal goes out and hits a building, for example, it will go in a certain direction and depending on its shape, may go in multitudes of directions. Diffraction, uh, as a wave passes by the edge of an instruction, it will bend around it and that can either help or hinder the signal. Uh, a good example of diffraction is putting your finger under the running water from uh, the kitchen tap, and you can see how that water bends around your finger. That's a, an example of diffraction. Interference, uh, when waves collide, uh, may be good if they're going in the same direction, but bad if they hit head on. So all of these things are consideration when that signal is flying through the air. Okay, so here's a look of uh, some of the paths and how that signal travels and how some of these things affect the travel of a signal. So here, microwaves, you can see run on a line of sight. If you can't see the receiver, it's probably not going to get there. Radio, uh, again, most uh, radio waves work best when you can see the other end, but that being said, the signal can be bounced off of other things and still get to their source. Satellite communication, for example, uh, will eliminate a lot of the problems by sending the signal up to a satellite and then back down to a receiver on the ground, eliminating all of the obstacles that may be uh, 
on the surface. So path plays an important role. And this leads us to antennas uh, on each end of the communication system, the transmitting end and the receiving end, you're going to have antennas. And again, their job is to receive a modulated signal and send it to the modem so that it can be demodulated and turned into a baseband signal that our computers and PLCs can use. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about antennas and the different types of antennas. First type of antenna is an omnidirectional antenna. And in the ILM, you'll have graphics that represent what it looks like uh, coming out of the antenna uh, as you look down on them. And you'll see omnidirectional kind of sends a signal in a, in a circle out from all sides of the antenna. And it has equal power in all directions, incoming and outgoing. Second type of antennas, general category of antennas is directional antennas. So in a transmitting mode, they'll focus the energy in one or two directions. Uh, and if it focuses that broad energy, the omni, uh, omnipresent energy into a, a specific direction, it can go farther. And this effect of power increase is called gain. And it's really the aiming of the signal. In the receiving context, uh, it'll also detect best in one or two directions and are more sensitive to the signal in a specific direction. And that's why you find you'll have to go and aim the antenna in a SCADA system in order to get the best signal. And this is also expressed in terms of gain. So here's some different antenna types. Uh, the first type here is a monopole type antenna. And I should have a graphic pop up here. There we go, monopole type antenna. The simplest type of antenna, and again, uh, as we progress through these antennas, we start out with the simplest, most basic type, and then we kind of uh, build our way up to what the most common uh, antenna that we use for most applications is. So this is the simplest type. It is an omnidirectional type antenna. So notice the picture, which is not up. Where's the picture? There we go. Here's the picture above. Uh, the coverage is a circle. So if we're looking down at the top of this antenna, here's the top of the antenna looking down, and the signal radiates out in every direction from that antenna, uh, same strength in transmitting and receiving. The length of the antenna, believe it or not, and this is probably the most fascinating thing you're going to get out of this section, the length of the antenna depends on the frequency wavelength that you're intending to uh, receive or transmit. So if you're trying to fabricate uh, an antenna for your television at the cabin, for example, where you don't have cable, having a different length will, will uh, pick up different frequencies. And there's some fancy math in there uh, that goes with this. And yes, there is uh, some math for you folks to do related to uh, antenna length and frequency using, <clears throat> using this formula here. Okay, so let's look at an example of this math. If the radio frequency uh, required to detect is 300 megahertz, how long should the antenna be? So if we go back to our formula here, um, take the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared. That's this number here. And we add this to our 300 megahertz or 300 times 10 to the six or a million, million hertz. That tells us that we need a one meter long antenna in order to be able to effectively transmit and receive a 300 megahertz signal. So pretty straightforward math. Um, you can expect something like that. Okay, second type of antenna here is a dipole antenna, uh, essentially made of two dipole elements, as you'll see here. Come on, there we go, two dipole elements. Oops, got a little bit too far away there. How do I go backwards? Don't have the provision for going backwards, do I? Yes, I do. There we go. So here's the dipole antenna made of two dipole elements, one here and one here. And if I go back a little bit, oh, snap. Okay, uh, I wish these would both show up at the same time, but they don't. But if you're looking down at this, you would see this is an elliptical shape, meaning that it's stronger in two directions, one direction this way and one direction this way. It's more or less circular a little bit omni, a little bit directional, 
And the reason that we get that is, of course, because stronger as it pokes out from this side, stronger as it pokes out from this side, not so much from these areas here. Last but not least, probably recognizable to those of you who do uh, lots of field work is the Yagi style antenna here. High gain, it's really the first one that we've really mentioned gain. We did mention gain on the dipole being about zero, meaning it's not particularly strong in any direction. Uh, here we have the Yagi, which is very directional, the gain. Uh, three to 10 decibels. We're not too worried about these values to you. It's a comparative value, just saying that this is far more directional than the previous examples that we looked at. And if we were to do a top-down view, looking at a Yagi antenna, very strong signal transmission and receiving capabilities in one direction. And that is the direction, of course, that the antenna is pointing in. Last but not least, we have parabolic antennas or dish antennas, very big ones like this. You may have a very small one on your house. Uh, again, very high directionality here, or as I like to call it, freaky long in one direction here. It goes very, very, very far. Uh, I can't see this, I don't see the scale on there, but it's like uh, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It's like 60 dBs here versus uh, 10 dBs here. So very, very directional in comparison to even a Yagi. So if you're way, way, way out in the boonies, this is probably what you're going to need. If you're in Rocky Mountain House or anywhere else, you're probably running one of these guys. Okay, very highly directional. Transmitter and receiver is positioned in front of the dish at the parabola or the focal point. Uh, the idea here, not a great picture, but as the signal comes in from the sky, it hits the dish and bounces towards the receiver and transmitter, which are mounted in the point here at the center of the dish. And that is the end of part two.